Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Kemp and I'm a student of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge in the UK and get excited because today I'm going to take you on a journey to the centre of the Earth. And the Earth here, represented by this inflatable globe, is actually about 6,371 kilometres in radius and weighs about 6 trillion trillion tonnes, so that's 6 with 24 noughts after it, so it's pretty big. If a commercial flight wanted to fly all the way around, it would take about 50 hours. And if you wanted to walk all the way around, which would be a very brave thing to do, that would take you about 11 years. And it's the third planet from the Sun and is spinning on its own axis at about 1,700 kilometers an hour and is spinning all the way around the Sun at about 100,000 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty big and it's moving pretty fast. But let's just slow down a second and have a think about what's actually going on beneath our feet. Now soon it's going to be my birthday and someone has very kindly bought me a present and of course I want to try and find out what is inside the present before that day itself. So what do you think are the different ways I could try and find out what the present is? I suppose I could, I could feel it and see if the present inside is expressed on the wrapping on the outside. I could shake it and try and hear what's inside or I could hold it up to the light and try and see what's inside. But what if I told you that I could never open this present ever? How would I actually find out what the present was? But that's a bit like how it is for scientists and the Earth. The Earth is like a gigantic present that they're never going to be able to unwrap. But they do know a lot about the structure and the composition of the inside of the Earth. How have they done that? One thing that they can do is dig a big hole. Now I want you to think about in groups how deep scientists have actually dug into the ground. Off you go. Welcome back. I wonder what suggestions you came up with for how deep we can dig into the earth. In fact, despite what some films may say, we can't actually dig that far down. If you took a drill and started drilling down, it would be okay until about 10 kilometers down, but then everything would fail because the deeper you get down into the earth, it gets hotter, about 25 degrees per kilometer, and it also increases in pressure. So drills, machinery, and certainly humans can't survive that far down. In fact, the deepest operational mine in the world is the Ashanti's Maponeng gold mine in South Africa, which is only about 3.9 kilometers down. So that's as deep as humans can go. And the Kola super deep borehole in Russia, which is about 12 kilometers, that's how deep the machinery can go. So if you compare this to how big the radius of the earth is, so that's how far it is from the surface to the center, which is about 6,371 kilometers, we've only been able to dig less than 0.2% into the Earth. So that's as if the Earth was a cricket pitch and you've only stepped one foot inside the boundary, or if the Earth was an apple, you've barely even broken the skin. If we can only dig about 10 kilometers down, how in Earth do we know what's actually going on inside the Earth? Because we do, we do know the structure of the Earth. So what other methods can scientists use? Have a think in groups, what other ways we can find out what the structure of the Earth is like? Perhaps thinking about what could travel through the Earth and think about my present that I had, which is here, and the different methods that I used to try and find out what was in it. Off you go. Hello again. I hope you came up with some interesting suggestions on how we can find out what's inside the Earth. So there are limits to how far we can go down, so we need to find something that can travel through the Earth. Do you remember what I did when I tried to find out what was inside my present? I shook it, didn't I? And tried to hear what was going on inside. Scientists can do a similar thing with the Earth. They can shake the Earth in a way and send sound waves of a sort through the Earth. These sound waves are seismic waves, and they can be caused by lots of different things. They can be caused by earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, and man-made explosions. 
they travel through the Earth, and then seismographs are taken at lots of different places around the Earth, and you can work out how long it took for those seismic waves to travel through the Earth. When seismic waves travel through different materials, different things happen to them, and they travel at different speeds. So that's how you can work out the different materials that are in the Earth. Some seismic waves can go through the Earth, such as the P waves and the S waves, but some are surface waves, and they travel along the surface of the Earth. Why don't you take a moment to think about the different kinds of waves with your teacher? So the P wave, the S wave, and the surface waves. Once you've done that, you can take a slinky and try and produce those different kinds of waves with it. And when you've done that, have a think about what would happen if you cut the slinky into lots of tiny pieces and then try to um, produce the same waves, the P waves and the S waves, and think about what would happen then. So off you go and have some fun with your slinky. Welcome back. I hope you had good fun trying to make the different kinds of waves with the slinkies. And now the wait is over because I'm going to show you the structure of the Earth. There are three main layers of the Earth. The crust, the mantle and the core. Let's start with the crust. We know the most about the crust because we live on it and we can take direct samples of it. There are two types of crust. There's the oceanic crust, like this, which is, has a very high density and is very heavy and often made up of rocks like basalt. And then there's the continental crust here, which is low density, relatively light and made up of rocks like granite. The crust is split into various major plates and some smaller ones as well. And when they come into contact with each other, lots of interesting things happen, such as earthquakes, volcanoes and mountains. One thing that can happen is when two parts of oceanic crust move apart from each other and they create massive mountain ranges under the ocean, like here. And that's when new bits of oceanic crust are being created. When two continental plates come together, they can crush each other and make massive mountains. But if a continental plate and an oceanic plate move together, one will go under the other and that will create lots of volcanoes. Also, plates can move past each other and cause lots of earthquakes. Now you may wonder why the plates on top of the earth move. Well, that's because of the next layer, the mantle. The mantle is made of a very, very dense material, so it's very heavy, called peridotite. We know this because magma, which is created at the boundary between the crust and the mantle, can rise up in volcanoes and entrain bits of the lower mantle and bits of peridotite come out of these volcanoes. The mantle is a solid, but it's very, very hot. So that means it can move and convect at very slow speeds. And that's why the plates on top can move. The center of the earth is called the core and it's made of iron. We know this for three reasons. Firstly, we know the average density of the earth is about six grams per cubic centimetre. The density of the rocks on the crust are about three grams per, per cubic centimetre. So we need a really dense material to be at the centre of the earth to make that average density of six. Iron has a density of 7.5 grams per cubic centimetre, so that fits. Also, the earth has a magnetic field and to have that, it must have a conductive material at its centre. Iron is a conductive material, so that also works. And the third reason is because we find meteorites, so rocks that have fallen from outer space, which are made of just iron. And we think these come from small planets which have been smashed up and parts of their iron cores have come hurtling to the ground. The core is split up into two parts the inner core, which is solid, and the outer core, which is a liquid. We know this because of the seismic waves. Do you remember when I asked you 
What would happen if you cut up the slinky into lots of small parts? Would the P and S waves still be able to propagate along it? Well, it's a bit like the difference between a solid, like the inner core, and a liquid, the outer core. The solid inner core is like the complete joined up slinky. The P waves and the S waves can move along it fine. The broken up slinky is like the liquid outer core. All the different molecules aren't really joined together, so the P wave can just about travel through because it pushes each of the molecules in front of it, but the S wave can't travel through at all. The seismographs around the world, they don't show S waves when they're in a certain part of the world. And that means that the S waves haven't been able to travel through the liquid outer core. The boundaries between these different layers can be picked up because when seismic waves interact with them, they can reflect and refract and convert into different types of waves and behave differently. So that's how we can tell there are these distinct boundaries. Now, if you recall, at the beginning of the lesson, we used a model Earth to represent a very complex situation of the Earth. Now we're going to use another model, and in this case, a hard-boiled egg. Your teacher will give you one of these, and I want you to first think about the different layers of the eggs. Can you think of them? Don't worry if you can't remember them, because you can cut your hard-boiled egg in half. Once you've written those layers down, think about how they correspond to the different layers of the earth. Off you go. Welcome back. How did you do? Did you have to cut your egg in half? Don't worry if you didn't, I'll show you mine. So here is the egg that I've cut in half. Let's start with the surface of the egg. The shell represents the crust. Now do you remember what I told you about the crust? That it's split into lots of different tectonic plates. We'll come to that thought in a minute. Now if I open the egg, you can see the various different parts. We've got the white here, which represents the mantle, and the yellow yolk in the middle, which represents the core. Now, do you think that the hard-boiled egg is a good representation of the Earth? It does have the three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core, but what about those tectonic plates? How about we gently crack the egg to try and simulate this? Now I'm going to crack the egg. So a few taps on the table, and then roll it around. So you can see that this cracked eggshell represents all the different plates on the surface of the earth. Now some parts can pull apart like this and you can see the white of the egg underneath. That's like the mantle when the plates move apart from each other. Or they could come together and buckle, creating mountains or they could move past each other, tearing each other apart. Now, do you think the egg is a good representation of the Earth? I think there are a few problems with it. Firstly, the shell is pretty much the same density all the way round, but we know that the actual crust has the very dense and heavy oceanic crust made of basalt, and the lighter and less dense continental crust, mainly made up of granite. We also know that the plates move across the surface of the earth, but the pieces of eggshell don't really. The plates move because of the mantle being very hot and being able to move very slowly, but the white in this case is a solid and doesn't really move. Also, the core of the earth has the solid inner core and the liquid outer core, but of course the egg only has the one yolk, which is a solid, at its centre. Finally, the egg is not actually that spherical, and the Earth is pretty much a sphere. Can you think of any other differences between the egg model and the real Earth? There you go! You've gone on a journey to the centre of the Earth and found out what in Earth is going on beneath our feet. You've learned that scientists can't actually go down to the centre of the Earth because it gets too hot but that we use seismic waves that can travel to the centre of the Earth. 
which can be picked up by seismographs all over the world. You've learned about the different layers of the Earth and how you can represent that in lots of different ways. There's quite a lot of information in today's lesson, but I hope you all took it in. And, oh, I nearly forgot, if you want to, you can even eat your egg now. Before you go, I'd like you to think about a few questions related to the limitations of this egg model. Question one, how to change the egg model to overcome these weaknesses? Question two, what are some of the strengths of the egg model? Question three, can you think of better analogies for the Earth? And question four, what did the egg analogy teach you that you didn't already know? I hope you really enjoyed going on this journey and are really excited about learning more about this dynamic planet. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, I'm Matthew Kemp from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Thank you very much for checking out this video. This lesson is quite a technical one for a lot of, for the kids to take in, but there should be lots of activities to keep them really engaged, and as long as you keep them discussing things and communicating with each other, they should be able to get a good grasp of what I'm trying to teach them. A few things that the students should probably know about before this, so you can take them through it, they should know about density, so how much mass there is in a certain volume, and also about the different states of matter, especially solids and liquids. It would be also useful to make sure that they know that the Earth has a magnetic field and that meteorites come from outer space. The first activity is about discussing how deep scientists can actually dig into the Earth. Promote discussions in groups, get them talking to each other, and possibly you can put their suggestions on the board so they can check against it when the actual answer is revealed. The second activity is another discussion about the different methods that scientists use to find out what is inside the Earth. You could ask the kids what they already know about the Earth's structure, maybe write this up on the board as well, and you need to get them to think about what can travel through into the Earth, especially making them think about the different methods that are used to try and work out what was inside the present. When I actually reveal that we can only get 10 kilometers down, so less than 0.2% into the Earth, I've said a few analogies, but it may be useful if you make another more uh, pertinent analogy, say how many steps it is uh, from here to the nearest town. For the third activity, you're using slinkies. Now you can get two students, maybe to stand at the front, each to hold a different end of the slinky, to produce the P waves, the longitudinal waves, or the S waves, the transverse waves. You can also, if you have enough slinkies, give each of them to pairs in the class and get them to do the same. If you don't have a slinky to hand, then you can do this same demonstration, but with the students themselves. So you can do this in the classroom if you've got enough space, or if you've got too many students, then possibly go outside. You can get them all to line up in a line like this, all facing forward, and having each of their arms outstretched on each other's shoulders. Then gently get someone else to push from the back. So firstly, this will demonstrate the P wave, the longitudinal wave, so just pushing in one direction. Then you can demonstrate the S wave, which is transverse, so it moves perpendicular. So the person at the back needs to shake backwards and forwards. Perfect. Then to demonstrate the liquid, so when the slinky is cut up into small pieces, you need to ask them to take their arms off the person's shoulders in front, but just keep their hands outstretched. Now if I try and produce a P wave, it still works, but it doesn't work as well. And then if I try and produce an S wave by shaking them, it doesn't work at all. And that shows that S waves can't travel through a liquid. For the last activity, you'll be using a hard boiled egg. So you can provide each student with a hard boiled egg and make sure it's hard boiled so we don't get any messes. 
and um, also with a plate, maybe a napkin if there are any accidents, and a plastic knife. If you don't have an egg to hand, then you can use another analogy such as a pear or an apple or another fruit. You can also ask the students to bring in their own food materials if you want to save costs. When they're doing this activity with the eggs, um, it'll get to the point where they want to crack the egg. Now make sure they do this carefully, and also when they're cutting the egg, make sure this is done carefully as well. Whilst doing this activity, it would be useful to remind the students that this is all an analogy for representing the earth. So get them thinking about how the different layers of the egg represent the different layers of the earth. Also get them to think about the limitations of this egg model. Get them talking, maybe write some suggestions down on the board as well. Perhaps if you want to dig deeper into the concepts that we've covered in this video, you can look at the other videos in this series, such as ones about different plate boundaries and how they work and what happens when plates come together, and also about seismic waves. From this lesson, I hope the students can get a good grasp of the structure of the Earth, its different layers, the crust, the mantle, the outer core and the inner core, and also how scientists have found this out. Thank you very much for watching this video and good luck with the lesson.